I am so happy to be here today with, with Dr. David Schindler, the author of this very compelling book, Love and the Postmodern Predicament, and uh, Michael Leite, who's been with me many times in the past, talking about this book and talking about other work of Dr. Schindler's. And uh, I guess it's okay for me to call you David, so, so we'll, we'll move yeah. forward on that score. Um, before we talk about the particulars of the book, I wonder if you could just tell us what drew you to this particular topic? Well, two questions. The, the reason um, we got talking about you years ago when you did that lecture on love and beauty. Mm -hmm. And uh, Michael turned me on to that and we talked about that many times. And um, so what drew you particularly to that topic of beauty? And then what brought you to write about the postmodern predicament? I could actually talk for a very long time. Uh, I'll, tr I'll try to give you a succinct answer to those, those questions. Um, uh, two things stand out uh, to my mind here immediately, just in, in, in response. Uh, the first is that um, <clears throat> uh, my, my father, um, who, who passed away recently uh, uh, last November, he, uh, he made uh, love um, a, a particular theme of his own thought. And uh, for obvious reasons, he was a big influence on me. And I, I was always struck by his insistence that uh, love needs to be understood ontologically, that we need to think of the meaning of being as love. And, and, that so radically changes the way that one conceives of it. The one, in fact, <clears throat> I think it changes the way one experiences it. Um, and certainly um, uh, the way one, one thinks about it. Um, the question of beauty is one that uh, has always been a compelling one for me. I was always interested in the arts, um, in music and, and painting when I was, younger and um, the particular philosophers that attracted me were always those that gave special attention to beauty. But I wrote my um, uh, doctoral dissertation on Hundres von Balthasar, who uh, among the many things that he accomplished, one of the things is his introduction of beauty into giving it this central place in theology. And I realized that um, uh, it's interesting in the beginning of his uh, work where he does this, he mentions that uh, philosophers can only imagine uh, beauty is coming last, whereas for theology, it needs to come first. And I thought, you know, that's not true. I think philosophers also <laughs> can understand beauty is coming first and that that um, opens up uh, a way, in fact, of appropriating this um, first dimension that I mentioned, which is love as a matter of being, as 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 resonating um, uh, throughout all the levels of existence, not being simply an emotional thing or a matter of the will, um, I think there's a connection between those two points, and that was the inspiration behind the book. Once I started thinking about that, I realized it changes the way we think about reason and the will and um, truth and goodness and and really everything. Uh, so the the book was an was was a, a, a an attempt to spell some of that out. And you're spelling it out using the title "postmodern predicament." Was that just clickbait? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's it's uh, that's interesting. That was a very late edition. I, I think I, I I can't even remember what the original title that I had. Uh, uh, slapped on there initially as a kind of a working title, but it was something fairly banal. And um, through, uh, through the copy editing process, so this was late in the, in, the, in the production of the book, I came to uh, realize that um, all of the um, essays and all of the lines of reflection were, were trying to respond to this um, uh, sense, this I think dominant sense of what what the person is in our contemporary world, and it's it's different from the the modern. Uh, so much of the a lot of the the sort of Catholic um, uh, intellectual um, sort of classical Catholic intellectual work is done criticizing the modern conception. I realize you know the postmodern conception is something really different 
I mean, it's related, but it's something that's that that poses its unique problems. And and the essays um, in the book were all uh, uh, aspects of that dialogue. So so that's where the um, the postmodern predicament, love and the postmodern predicament. And if I may uh, 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 say one more word about that, um, the publisher initially had proposed a um, um, a cover that showed um, this romantic cu couple sort of silhouetted against a, a, a sunset. And I thought, you know, um, I didn't want to cause trouble, but that seemed to me to reinforce so many of the things I was trying to to avoid there and so he asked me for a, um, an alternative proposal and I uh, I thought of um, Heidegger's engagement with the jug as um, uh, he has a, a classic essay where he talks about the the essence of a jug this very ordinary human artifact and how it opens up to this profound experience of the world um, and I wanted to capture something of that. And so, so this is the cover as you the jug, have it. Yeah. yeah, it's a, it's, now, you, you I would have never guessed the, that, but, but I, I, I get it immediately. Yeah. Once you said it, I get it immediately. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think it was, uh, the one that he found was really outstanding. It's a beautiful cover, I think. And the, the, um, it, it does, uh, evoke some of the, uh, feelings i suppose some of the experience that um i had hoped so i was very happy with his choice well that gives us a good place to kick off from so michael do you want to start with the first question <clears throat> sure um i guess i'm, I'm curious um it, it's an amazing book first of all and i've i've enjoyed reading it it's i, I don't feel like i feel like i could probably read it like two or three more times um and and get get uh, a lot out of each subsequent read. I'm curious how it was that you came upon this sort of, um, I don't know if you want to call it a discovery or, or notice this, this in, in the reading, your reading of Thomas, that he's, there's something of an error, maybe perhaps in his ordination of love to uh, the order or the transcendental of, of goodness versus beauty. Like what was, what was the kind of the genesis of that? And how did that make its way to the book? Yeah, no, thank you. I, I don't know the genesis of that, actually. Um, I don't recall when I started thinking uh, that or where that idea came from, but uh, probably, I mean, it, it, it grew out uh, out of, no doubt, um, uh, an engagement with um, the question of beauty in Neoplatonism. I had a, a professor in graduate school who was a profound influence on me, uh, he teaches uh, now out um, at uh, Loyola Marymount, um, California, Eric Pearl, um, a, a real living, breathing Neoplatonic philosopher who opened up um, the glories of Plotinus and Dionysius the Areopagite. And I was, abs well, I, I had always had a deep, deep love of, of Plato from the, the, the moment I started reading him. And uh, the, the significance of beauty in that tradition struck me and I, it, it's it's uh i was always troubled by the fact that beauty seems to be it's it, it's obviously a very controversial point um but when aquinas lays out his classic exposition of the transcendental properties beauty's not there and so one of the great controversies with aquinas is whether he thought of beauty as a transcendental or um or didn't because he seems to describe it in similar terms in other contexts, but in his classical exposition, it's not mentioned. And um, anyone who wants to tr to retrieve beauty uh, in dialogue with Aquinas has to find a proper place for it. And I suppose it was that question combined with um, this uh, compelling vision that I had uh, acquired from, from Plato and Plotinus um, and Dionysius, um, that uh, I, I thought that 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 would be the way to do it. And the moment I started to, so connecting it, especially to love and distinguishing love from the act of the will, and we could go into all sorts of technical details here. And I, I don't know how far you want to go, but. Um, yeah, we, uh, we can we can probably dig into that as we move along, because I, yeah. I have a lot of questions kind of that are relative to that. 
but okay, I'll, yeah, I'll, on the broad scope. I'll follow your lead about uh, where where you'd like to go. But just to finish the point, it, it it became it started to become apparent that once you do make that association, there are all sorts of things that start to fall into place, even with a um, uh, Thomistic anthropology, but but um, in a really basic way, just with one's experience of of beauty and its relationship to love and how that transforms love. Um, you know, if you think of love as simply a desire for um, gratification in in the good, which is really the the the, the transcendental order of the good in the Thomistic theory as a, a matter of appetite, as a matter of desire. Not that there's, a, uh, I, I mean, I think that that's an incredibly, that's an indispensable part of it, um, but it seems to leave out this notion of gratuity and play and the the idea that Kant brought in. Kant, um, I, I, you know, he's one of my arch nemesis, uh, arch nemesis in philosophy, but uh, some of his insights into the nature of, of beauty, I think are really, really uh insightful and profound and, and illuminating um this notion of the he calls it disinterested character but this this sense of gratuity i think is better um the aspects of of that 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 uh um i think deepen and enrich our sense of what love is um all of these things really came to sort of a point of convergence that that um made me think this is the way to go I, I i haven't it's it's curious with these sorts of things you always wonder what the broader academic community makes of some of these um proposals and i've had very little experience uh little feedback on the question but i'm I, i'm going to have an opportunity this um summer a week-long um fac a seminar not a faculty seminar but a, a week-long uh a workshop in in Rome with some Dominicans. Um, wow. We're going to be debating the place of beauty in Aquinas's thought. So I might get some uh, chance to see what others make of it. But I, I'd be interested to know what um, what what struck you in particular, or uh, either of you, if there's some dimension that um, seems seems right or seems problematic, or or well, one of the reasons that. Michael and I started talking about it several years ago was <clears throat> that the reason I started this channel was to talk about what I saw. I, I had begun to see this big overlap between the way that I had learned about creativity, mm -hmm. the intersection of the elements and principles of design yeah. related to creativity and beauty. And okay. how that seems to lay out over the whole creation and over every single domain of knowledge and over every mm -hmm. level of reality. And um, and so then Michael brought this to my attention, your discussion about love and beauty. And uh, we spent quite a bit of time talking about that. So, I mean, that's where my connection comes into that because when I, and, and this is maybe why I could ask you this question right now, since we're on the topic the transcendentals, we tend to think of them as beauty, goodness, and truth, whatever order you want to put those in. It seems to me that of the three, beauty is the one where there's the most room for flexibility and creativity that, I mean, goodness and truth seem to be sort of perfect crystalline um, concepts or entities. Right. Right. But that beauty is somehow the connection between the two is more like a, a line along which there is an infinite variability that's possible, but it's still beauty. Right. Would that right. be a correct thing to say? I, I, I think so. I, I think um, I was just uh, talking on uh, last night, night before last with a, a friend of mine about the work of uh, Robert Persig was yes um, yes we talked about Arab him a lot here too. Yeah. you know that 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 book um, had a huge impact on me when I was in high school it was it was it that book I I I point to that as sort of the origin of my uh, uh, intellectual vocation that that made a really strong impact and his his question was like as you know, uh, the meaning of quality. And I, I mean, in a certain sense, it's this question of beauty. And, and, and uh, he um, struggled, I suppose. Uh, he, he recognized that, there, that, that um, it, it, 
it seemed to to um, not to fit into any of the basic categories. It's not really objective. It's not subjective. You know, where, whereas we tend to think, um, uh, you know, if it's not one, it has to be the other. And this seems to transcend the difference between the two. And mm -hmm. and uh, there are a number of other things like that. And I think that's that's part of the distinctive distinctiveness of beauty is it it's precisely as the beginning it precedes the differentiation of the different categories in a way um that's i think that that might be one of the reasons why it um uh you know why it it doesn't appear in aquinas in a way uh, uh, a possible explanation is that it's too too comprehensive in a way too too original it's sort of the context in which the other transcendentals unfold and and when you start thinking in those lines along those lines you you really do get a sense of this um space this um um uh op opening up of horizons you know this the, uh, rather than um um uh bringing things to a final resolution even though there is a kind of completeness in beauty it's a completeness that always coincides with this you know, a Kant referred to the play of the faculties. That um, that this this notion of play, um, Schiller is another one who brings a a special connection between play and beauty together. I think that's that's really essential to it. Um, if you think of it as at the beginning, it it opens things up. You know, so well, you yeah, you go into that in yeah. Uh, on page, I've, I've got a note on that on page 134 and 135. Okay. So, so maybe we'll get there. Um, <clears throat> so Michael, you were going to say something before I jumped in. <clears throat> Do you remember what it was? Um, in reference yeah, my, to my, my, my mind goes in so many different directions, but um, okay. I, w one of the things that kind of struck me about the, about the book and just, I mean, especially, you know, with Thomas being such a, a kind of, I don't know, towering figure in the west like i want i wonder if you have any thoughts about what impact him leaving beauty out of his transcendental yeah. mind in terms of those that come after and try and follow in his steps that's that's a great question uh in fact i you know um i already mentioned uh heidegger uh heidegger famously talks about the forgetfulness or forgottenness of of being the 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 um uh, oblivion of being. Um, I, I think that that uh, arguably something can be said uh, along those lines for beauty, and I think there there's a connection between the two of them. Actually, um, it seems uh, like beauty is, in some sense, our perception of of beauty. Like it's it, it's 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 a vehicle whereby it's possible for us to somehow, as limited finite things, to have some sort of physical embodied perception of the whole. Because mm -hmm. as you point out in that that that's right. uh, that Karen was making reference to, in, in a certain sense, when you when you see the the beauty of a thing, you are also perceiving the beauty of being itself, and and those two things are happening simultaneously. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly right, and 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 also you you have a profound um, uh, um, sense of your own self. It's 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 interesting. I was. Um, attending to this the other day uh listening to this extraordinary choir singing and recognizing that um in that experience of beauty you you're simultaneously um it, i mean it, it really is quite comprehensive the experience you feel like you're you're carried into yourself into your sort of interiority there's a deep in, um but it's not in the least bit introspective in the sense of introversion um, so it's simultaneous with this absolutely exquisite sort of attentiveness to what you're listening to, the distinctiveness of the thing that you're experiencing. And then that coincides with this openness to the whole of reality. So, I mean, it's, it's really amazing. All of these elements are there at once. And I think precisely because it's such an original sort of uh, opening experience, it's easy to 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 leave it out. You begin it. You you begin to attend to the things that it opens up for you, rather than attending to that um, experience of openness. And and I you know I do think um, that uh, 
you know, uh, it's intellectual histories, you know, genealogies are too, too, it's too simple to blame a particular figure for, for, for a loss or something, but, but it cannot, but be significant, um, that, that Aquinas left, that, left that out and that, that, um, uh, we've had certain, uh, problems with rationalism, a certain kind of subjectivism, relativism, all these sorts of, um, fragmentary um, visions of reality that, that follow, follow in that wake. Um, well, one of the things that you talk about from the beginning of the book, actually, is this idea of contact with reality hmm. and that beauty in many ways is that, that first, you talk about beauty as the givenness, mm -hmm. something reaching out to us at the same time drawing us towards, so it's this reciprocal move. So this contact with reality, I've thought often of where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the light. Mm -hmm. But that mm -hmm. truth, aletheia, means truth, and it also means reality. Yeah. And so um, so this, this drawing, well, and then when you're talking about the contact with reality, you go, you go on a little bit after that, and you say, um, in an exploration of three of the traditional transcendental properties, beauty, goodness, and truth, each characterizes a special form of man's encounter with reality. And then you go on to describe the three, mm -hmm. which we don't have to do here, but I can as we go along. But it sounds very much like the process of knowing yeah. that um, Esther Meek talks about. I know that Esther Meek has had a, yeah. a good a friendship with you for a long time. But that beauty is that first uh, glimpse of what it is that we want to know. It's drawing us into that knowing. And then the goodness would be, you, you describe it as man pursuing the real, engaging in the free action that is inescapably a kind of gift of self, an involvement of his person with what is other than himself. Um, one of the examples Esther used was learning how to take care of a rose bush. Mm -hmm you have to fall in love with that rose bush in order to understand yeah. what it really needs. And yeah. the rose bush speaks back to you and tells you what it needs. This is very similar to painting a painting. Right. You have the first thought, but then as you begin the process of trying to capture that thought in paint, the painting begins to speak back to you. Mm -hmm. So it, it develops this reciprocal relationship. And then you said in truth, he becomes what he knows. He identifies himself in a certain respect with what he comes to understand, taking it into his very being, which made me think of, yes, the, the culmination of, of learning something new is always the finding out that the, within that learning is the seed of the next thing that you want to know. So it becomes this, it goes back right. again to the beauty drawing you again, higher up and further in, right? That's right, right. The the better you understand it, then the more it man it, it manifests. The more epiphanic it becomes, mm -hmm. and right starts the process over again. I was wondering if you were familiar with Esther Meeks. Um, uh, we've talked about her a lot. She's she's been have... on a couple of times. Oh, yeah. she has. I, don't, okay. I only published one of them, but the other one, she and I had a long talk about some of these things. She's yeah. got a book coming out uh, soon called uh, "Doorway to Artistry." I thought mm -hmm. of of that when you said you've always been interested in, in the process of creativity in a way that the whole book is is about yeah. that um, yeah that's supposed to be out i think in a couple months it should be out soon but um so it, it sounds like the <clears throat> idea of knowing but then it also and you probably talk about i i didn't finish the book i got i got up to chapter five and then i tried to jump ahead to chapter seven so i didn't yes. get six <laughs> so maybe someplace you talk about this but it also sounds like like the marriage, the marriage mm -hmm. supper of the lamb, oh, the, right. the bride of Christ, sure. you know, all of those things that that union of um, of the lover and the beloved, right? That also sounds like that kind of union. You know, one of the um, and, and uh, I recognize the last or the the, uh, the last couple of chapters in the book are much. Uh, more difficult to follow. I guess the, the, the last one, maybe not, but I, I, I've been told uh, by many people, the publisher, first of all, that um, 
the book seems to take kind of a hard turn. Um, <clears throat> So but it wasn't I wasn't that it was hard. I just ran out of time because uh, I, okay. the rest of it was so hard. It took me a yeah. while. <laughs> yeah, well, um, you know, the, uh, uh, while you were talking there, uh, one of the um, themes that I've been thinking a, a bit about more lately since, uh, since writing that is how important um, imagination, the imagination is in this, in this context. Um, and I think if I were to write the book again, I'd 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 bring that dimension out a, a bit more. It's um, there's something that you you know you 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 pointed to these images of the 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 wedding feast of the lamb and so forth. There's you know what is it about an image like that that you know we, we sometimes in in traditional um, classical epistemologies theories of knowledge uh, we think of of beginning in sense experience and then forming things in our imagination, but eventually we want to get to the concepts. So we're, we're, we're sort of passing through the, the sensible dimension to get to the intelligible dimension. And there's a certain truth to that, but it's, it's becoming increasingly clear to me that um, as human beings, it's really fundamental that we return to this, the sensible dimension. I mean, we, we are, uh, embodied creatures and um, the resurrection of the body is is part of the the Christian uh, doctrine that that the bodies are never the bodies are never left behind and that seems to um, uh, confirm this idea that our act of understanding is is really in the end also an act of vision um, uh, and a very a very integrated concrete sense of knowing things that um, involves the whole person and not just the intellect. It involves the, the will, it involves um, desire, it involves the heart, even all of these at once. Um, I think that's, that's again, a, an aspect that I think we've lost and it's connected to our loss of a sense of beauty and our loss of a sense of being. All of these are connected. Also a loss of a sense of authority. That's a whole other line of <laughs> reflection that has opened up for me recently, but I, I don't think we, need to uh, follow any of that out here uh, i'm curious are, are you familiar with the work of um owen barfield have you yes, read yes. Of him? okay that, yes. that was because that was a big bone of contention between i don't know if you're familiar with the, the quote-unquote great war between owen right. barfield and c.s lewis that yes. was kind of like a, a pivotal thing in their conversation was whether whether the imagination was a truth-bearing faculty that's right. That's right. And I and I have to say I love C.S. Lewis, but I I think Barfield was right right there. Um, I mean, you know, probably with some necessary qualifications, but uh, that the the tradition out of which Barfield is working with with uh, Goethe at the heart of it, um, I think is 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 a another uh, dimension that is helpful to bring in here. Yeah, and and. I, I too, I think, um, I, I don't know, something about, um, you know, Barfield has, has an interesting, you know, take on where we've gone in terms of like what you were talking about. We, we need to have this, what also made me think Barfield is you, we need to have this return to, uh, instead of trying to think of the intelligible, right. this kind of high thing, we need to have this return. And I don't know how much you've read him, but like he has this idea of, you know, we, we, we kind of, fall out of this thing he, he refers to as sort of original participation okay and um which and, and he traces this his a lot of his work is is focuses on language itself and mm -hmm. he calls you know the, the the way words change over time he, yeah. he calls you know he says the sort of he has a book called history in english words where he he talks about words as kind of like fossils of consciousness that we can right. kind of by tracing their movements and we can see how how kind of like man's collective consciousness has changed and we we've sort of had this sort of i mean it it, it kind of tracks with you know sort of ideas like in um say charles taylor and, and the differences like with the, the the porous versus like this this buffered self and right. it, you i feel like in in your introduction you, you're sort of making reference to that as well when you you talk about sort of modern culture being a sort of conspiracy to kind of keep the real at bay from us right um right but, yeah. Anyway, I, 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 because I, I, I've read a lot of Barfield, I, I had a lot of his ideas while I was reading. That's, yeah, so. I don't know about the original participant. Well, I, no, that is ringing a bell. Come to think of it, I do know Michael Defusha. 
Um, I do. I've actually had had a few conversations with him. Like he's he's gotten to be a friend, actually. Okay. Okay. Yeah. His book is great on on uh, on Barfield, but um, uh, the history of of uh, English words is that uh, yeah that um, uh, I really love that book. It's been a while since I've read it, but um, uh, in fact, thank you for reminding me that, that he would be a good source to go back now that this theme of imagination has reemerged. Um, uh, but I, you know that's that's. Um, you know the, the the interesting question then is w what would be uh, the relationship between this importance of beauty and imagination and um, uh, the the embodiment of consciousness in in words in words understood you know not just as signs but as as symbols a more robust sort of sense of symbols and then this this theme of the flight from reality i think there is actually a connection um yeah. you know if there's 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 certainly a connection between um our having a, a very abstract sense of what knowledge is as a kind of um retention of information um that that, that uh that is is separated from its source um there's a connection between that uh, and uh, a sense of the the self as sort of an isolated, um, as as cut off, base in no. a really fundamental way from from reality. And then by by contrast, um, you know what what it what is it about the sense world what, what uh, that um, that relates to this question? I mean, one one of the things that's that's really remarkable. I mean, we, we can think about it, we can we experience it so directly and immediately is that, you know, in and through the senses, we're, we're all, the world is already in us. Mm -hmm. We don't we don't have to uh, make a decision to enter into the world, but we're already dwelling in it and it's already dwelling in us. And that there's already a kind of um, uh, a relationship uh, there that's presupposed by our subsequent acts of intellect and will and so forth and and um you know if 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 we acknowledge that we recognize that, that you can't shut the world out um it's always it's already too late uh, uh, uh and 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 you know it that's that turns out to be in all sorts of ways a kind of self self subverting strategy uh, you know, by 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 contrast, we can we can recognize uh, the 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 goodness, the generosity of the, that fact, the fact, the, the 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 beauty, the radiance, the glory of the real uh, uh, in that, and so that this this presence of reality in our imagination and therefore in our thinking, this organic sense, um, is is something that actually liberates our individuality our creativity our freedom uh rather than being a compromise or a threat of some sort well in, uh, you were talking at one point i think it's pages 44 and 45 about um schiller hmm. and you said schiller said that beauty occurs when freedom comes to appearance in and through natural form yeah yeah. Um, and for Heidegger, the tension generated by the human work to transform a thing of nature that simultaneously aids and resists that effort. That's the way painting, you're going to find that out about painting. It simultaneously <laughs> aids and resists your effort. Yes. But uh, <clears throat> what we find in all of this is an interplay between freedom and nature in which the natural reality provides an anchor and a guide for freedom, setting the terms for it as it were even as it is being transcended, elevated, enhanced, transformed, creatively interpreted. Then you made a comment that art is not meant to compete, but to reveal. And all of this just made me think about the very ending of Barfield's book, Speaker's Meaning. Okay, I don't know that one. Yeah, it's a little book. Um, Michael and I went through it chapter by chapter and spent a lot of time talking about it. It's also a very difficult book. Yes. But um, only for me, because I'm a little bit slow on this stuff. But um, <clears throat> here's what Barfield says. He said, it becomes clear to us that the task of Homo sapiens when he first appeared as a physical form on Earth was not to evolve a faculty of thought somehow out of nothing. Not mm -hmm. 
intelligible thing, right? Right. But to transform the unfree wisdom, which he experienced through his organism as a given meaning mm -hmm. into the free subjectivity that is correlative only to active thought, to the individual activity of thinking. And I think he's saying that the unfree wisdom and the given meaning are somehow related to the idea of instinct. Hmm. That instinct was right. a much more natural thing before we began to focus so much on the intellect. Right. And uh, an instinct is something we really, I think that's one of the ways we become unmoored because mm -hmm. I think back to my mother's generation. Mm -hmm they instinctively understood a lot of things about how to put out a nutritious plate of food. Yeah. And you can go back generations before and every culture on earth instinctively right. knew what kinds of foods they needed to prepare out yeah. of what they had available in order to make nutrients that would sustain people. Now right. it's all the intellectual stuff, you know, right. the hierarchy of foods, which has turned out to be a complete disaster because we've right. lost. It has to be revised every few years. Yeah, we've lost yeah. this unfree wisdom, the given meaning that was mm -hmm. that was somehow available to us that um, that isn't available when we shut off that part of us. Yeah. So in that vein, I was going to ask you if you've run into the work of Ian Gilchrist. Have you had any conversations? You know, I, his name keeps getting uh, mentioned. I have not uh, explored his work yet. Um, but well, because he's, to be he's, on to the, yeah. he's on to the same thing you are, where you said um, to, to get back to the sensible. Mm -hmm. He talks about the the brain, the two hemispheres of the brain. Oh, he feels like the and, and he's he's a neuroscientist and a neuropsychologist and uh, I mean he's got so many degrees you wouldn't believe. But anyway, he makes the argument that the left hemisphere of the brain is the hemisphere that's um, mostly related to this taking an idea and analyzing it and taking it apart and building things out of it. And the right hemisphere is the only hemisphere of the brain that has access to the outside world. Okay. Okay. So the right hemisphere is the openness and the, the way he, he would never say this, but in my, in my picture, the mm -hmm. right hemisphere is more like this idea. We have of femininity of the receptiveness okay. of femininity sure. and, and the left hemisphere is more like the builder and the, sure, you know, that engineering, kind of, right? Yes. <laughs> and so much more like uh, the picture that we might have of the archetypal masculinity and the archetypal femininity. Mm -hmm. And that, that the best thing is when there's a marriage there, when there's a union, but what has happened over time, you know, where Barfield talks about the fossils of consciousness in the words, McGillchrist would use, wouldn't use that same language, but he, he, went, he goes all the way through all the philosophies from the beginning up until now and looks at the times in philosophy when the left hemisphere had taken over more. Yeah. And then other times when the right hemisphere was when, when things would come back and reconnect into this sensible world. Um, but that he says now we've become unmoored from the sensible world almost entirely. The left hemisphere has like gotten control right and uh as he makes very compelling argument and right um right i mean it seems it seems you might want to uh i mean it, it it's whenever one takes control the other one does in an opposite it typically those the opposites tend to coexist you you end up having an unmoored intuitive yeah. you know sort of subjectivity and so forth i i that would be interesting to think through um, but that that's that sounds um, that sounds excellent and really illuminating. Um, thank you for the reference. In fact, I need to. Uh, well, I mean, that, if you uh, would be interested in talking to him, I think I could probably set it up. Would uh, that would to. be wonderful. I'd I'd need to take some time to to explore his work uh, first. Sure. But I, I, that that sounds that's a, a wonderful well, proposal. He's Fortunately, he's one of those guys who has put out a lot of YouTube content. So he's okay. condensed a lot of his teaching 
his first book is 1100 pages long his second okay. one is like 1700 pages long <laughs> but fortunately he's condensed a lot of it into one okay. and two hour lectures so okay okay um, all right well I'll, I'll look him up thank you very much but the, the I, question just, i wanted I may, to ask you about i wanted to ask you this question before we, we get lost okay. is that he makes the argument in all of his work that um He's not speaking from a religious standpoint, but just from mm -hmm. his own philosophical understandings sure. of things. Um, that that the the source, the source, rather than being being, mm -hmm. is becoming. Okay. This uh, constantly energetic creative right. force of becoming, and you make a, you, you are very consistent in talking about being. Yes. And I wondered if you could just relate a little bit. What would be the difference between those two? Is there a danger of one or the other? Sure. Yeah. I mean, that that's a great question and a really fundamental one. Um, I I I think that if if one does not begin with being, uh, ultimately, that that's the the implications are really quite disastrous in the long run. Now. Um, it would all, to, to my mind, it would all depend on how he, what he means by becoming, because it it may be that um, uh, that there's a there's a, a a way to see a connection between what he means by becoming, what I would want to to what I and and you know the classical philosophical tradition mm -hmm. would want to associate with being. But one of the basic things that one I'm sure we would ag uh, uh, agree on, and I think this is. Um, be interesting to hear your reaction i you know i think probably the 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 the, the uh um, most fundamental problem is a simple separation of those so that being becomes um caricatured as a kind of static um uh timeless uh abstract um um ultimately moribund uh sort of thing and then becoming is activity and life and movement and and i i think that um uh that that sort of separation of the two um leads one to 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 um i mean i it would take uh, some time to spell out some of the implications, but um, you know this is sort of the classic distinction between Parmenides and Heraclitus, and and you know a pure Heraclitean flux. You know maybe I've I, I've loved uh, Plato too much to uh, um, uh, not to to react to that, but a pure sort of flux where everything is you know becoming doesn't make sense unless there's direction in it, unless there's some unless it's trying to become something. Otherwise, what's the difference? You know, that'd be an interesting way to get into it. Which well, is so the that's the big question right there. Yeah. If, if something is trying to become something, then that implies a, a changeableness, which implies uh, some inadequacy right. in the current situation. If it, that's right. If, if, there needs if it to needs be to change. Point. Yes. Yes. So, so it's that point of changeableness right there. Yeah. In my mind, God is infinitely creative. Yeah. So, if God is infinitely creative, then then there's some some sort of life abundance and growth always happening. Sure. Then, then that is some sort of change. That's right. Right. So you can't say that that completely changeless or and in my club had and i've had this conversation before about what it means to be impassable right right but you can't say impassable about someone who gave his life on the cross and that's right right so yeah, um, yes or or the, the the fathers of the church said the impassable one is has suffered the impassable one is passable mm -hmm. and uh it seems to me that's Plato said something similar about being that it's simultaneously changeless and full of change. I think that's those are the and that's what be beauty is 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 both um, activity, openness, playfulness, and and rest and completeness. That the that the the, the deepest starting point needs to be 
who needs to refuse to choose between one and the other that somehow has to see a unity of both because otherwise as, as as you were saying this you know if you to have a sense of a lack you you already have to have some sense of what you ought to be there's um uh, uh otherwise um uh there there couldn't be a lack you only experience a lack if you have some sense of the fullness that you that you want to attain that you need to attain and so change happens only when you have something that transcends um and you know you have transcendence and image so you have kind of perfection and incompleteness together you have you have um something eternal and something and and time so so I don't know if I'm making sense here, but well, I you think are. But I, I mean, to really is, see them I, together. I'm sorry to kind of take over, Michael. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> this is like super important to me because okay. um, I've also looked into quite a bit of like Whitehead's work. Okay. Um, but the thing that has always troubled me a bit in Whitehead is this idea that that God is. Um, right. He doesn't put it this way, but like trying to find himself or something. Yeah, that's and, right. And this idea of you know the becoming meaning, yes, yes, some sense of what you want to be, and then maybe that's even built into the structure of the universe. But then there's some idea that that the whole process of the world is God becoming what He wants to be, and is that. Is that but right? See, I, that doesn't. Uh, there's something that doesn't no, sound right about. Yeah, that. no. Only if he's already perfect. See, that's that's the the you um uh what I tend to react to is if if someone wants to um uh, uh thinks that the only way to to introduce openness and movement and life is precisely to eliminate perfection. Um, so that, oh, that, that that he's headed towards perfection. So so perfection is something that only comes at the end. And I, I, I think I think there's got to be a sense of perfection in, in the beginning. You know, this yeah, is, yeah. you know, uh, one of the themes in Neoplatonic philosophy is the is the the, the, the movement of the cosmos is an overflow of perfection mm -hmm. rather than an emptiness that's trying to fill itself up. And um, uh, I think that's really a crucial different so it's not god simply finding himself um uh you know that god is a, as absolute perfection is free enough to be able to enter into a state of you know having to 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 find you know to 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 seek with the sinner as it were you know um but that's that's a fruit of a perfection it's not because of uh, a, a radical lack in god i think the the whole cosmos really spins into nihilistic, gray, empty, meaninglessness. If 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 God, if we don't have a sense of absolute perfection at the source of things, mm -hmm. um, and I I, uh, I you know I know Whitehead is more is more uh, uh, subtle and complex than a lot of people make him out to be, but my my sense is that. Um, that there's more. Uh, I, I I would be a little cautious about the the emphasis on the on process, mm -hmm. but that yeah, that's that that opens up a different. Uh... <laughs> yeah, well, no, but I I just want to make sure I was on the right track. I mean, I have intuitions, but I don't have the uh, theological or philosophical background, and. Yeah. Um, I do talk to a lot of people who have gone down these paths and find them very compelling and they are very compelling, but, sure. but to me, there's always a little uh, problem there and, and you have to start with perfection. So, yeah. Yeah. I, and I, I think that we also have that experience that, um, you know, it's when it's uh, I find. So for, for instance, um, in the experience of great joy, Actually, C.S. Lewis, you mentioned C.S. Lewis. This is uh, uh, an observation he makes in um, uh, Surprised by Joy, if I recall correctly, um, that his longing was uh, was never so intense as when he experienced a kind of fulfillment as, as when he's happy. That there's there's a there's a sense in which um, I, I know that if I am in a state of joy. I actually find it 
easier to be attentive to the other, to be receptive to the other person and genuinely put myself, you know, um, enter into the, the other person's position and, and some, you know, uh, 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 attend to the person's needs. And so that that's strange if you think about it, because it's precisely the, my feeling of completeness that allows me to be open to what is more than myself. Uh, the opposite is if I'm in a state of neediness, um, in a way, it's harder for me to be open to the other because um, I can only think of the other in a, in a certain sense in relation to my own needs. And so this, this openness tends to become a kind of a, a, a deception. There's something deceptive about it. Uh, because it's driven by need, and so you see, you see, kind of existentially there the paradox. It's it's the the completeness that is more open to what's more, and the incompleteness that is closed. Um, I think that's very different. You know, postmodern thought plays with those concepts all over the place, but typically um, falls right into this problem of of having to deny perfection and completeness and selfhood and so forth unity in order to open to difference and otherness and i think that's uh, a, a losing a losing strategy and it tends to be self self-defeating and self-deceptive actually that was so good <laughs> thank you <laughs> Yeah, but I, I again i think i think existentially we we it, we experience things that way um now obviously there's a false sense of completeness where you know the the sphere people that aristophanes talks about in in the symposium that are so complete they're not open to um what's other but that's i think that's a different kind of completeness that's not a um, that's an impoverished sense of what completeness is mm -hmm. yeah that's a misunderstanding of boundaries Sure. Yeah. 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 That's another way of looking at it. Sure. Yeah. So, Michael, you, know, it's, you were about it's, to say something. Oh, no, just the, the reference to Lewis and him talking about his conception of joy. I think he <laughs> uses the word, um, was it Zenzuk? There's like a German word or something like that. Yeah. Zenzuk. Yeah. And it's like a, a sort of, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a sort of combination of both joy and, uh, like you said, longing. It's it's. Um, yeah. There you go. That was the word longing. That's what I was looking for. Yeah. I think you might you may see I said longing, but there, there it, it, to me, there's something emblematic in there in, in beauty itself in terms of bringing these two things together. A, a sort of like, and and for me, and in, in my experience of this, I often have my most my deepest phenomenological like rootedness in in that kind of experience. Oftentimes in in situations a lot of it's in in sort of um experiences of stories or something where there's there's a redemptive aspect to the story and where what you thought was was so awful and couldn't be redeemed is somehow you know transformed into yes. and, and so it not only is um it, it it's a, yeah it's, and and so there's a, a sort of a sort of I don't know, paradoxical element of like I don't know, an expression maybe also of, you know, the problem of evil as well in terms of like, how, how is it that, how is it that this, this good or all this, all this evil we see in the world can somehow be still taken up into this, this ultimately beautiful narrative, you know, like, um, and um, I don't know that, that, that's, I, I, I feel like a lot circling around a lot of these conversations is this, this problem of evil of like, mm. how, how do we explain um, what, what's happening? And, and um, I don't know. I, I think, I do feel like beauty is really important and like, yeah. And, yeah. and it's because of those phenomenological experiences I was just describing that for me kind of turned my life around in a lot of ways, because, you know, I, 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 and when I, when I first started having those experiences, I, I tried to ignore them because I thought like, mm. I was trapped in a sort of materialistic thinking where I thought this is just some weird subjectivity. And mm -hmm. it's like, and I expected when I explored it to find some sort of like weird kinks about like, you know, my own personal life, but it was always, it was always this 
this vista into the overall nature of being itself. That was always kind of shocked me. And um, yeah, I, one of the, so sorry, I, yeah. I have a hard time compressing all these thoughts, but no, I, there's, there's so much already in what <laughs> you've said, but oh, yeah. One of the things that I took away from your book was, was it seems to me like in the modern West that the, the truth is, is, too easily reducible to sort of like scientific facts mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and goodness gets like, you know, whittled away down to just moral rules, right? Like just, right. just but somehow right. beauty evades all that. And it, yeah. it seems, I, I often, you know, think about Dostoevsky's like throwaway line about beauty will save the world. I, I do feel like there's some, some yeah. hidden prophecy in that to some extent of, of how, how yeah. it all <clears throat> comes back together and, and we're all, surprised by joy in the end that that that, that was very beautifully said uh and you you really put your finger on a, uh, a number of i think really profound things i uh um the this um the surprise you know the uh one of the things that has struck that struck me most um in my uh study of balthazar hunters from balthazar is his sense of drama which is the simultaneity of, uh, at the core of it is this simultaneity of surprise and resolution that, um, that uh, uh, you know, it's, its expectations are, are reversed, um, but not in a way that just destroys them, reversed in a way that, that fulfills them, but in a totally unexpected sort of way. And I, and I think that that's, that's at the heart of so much of these things that we've been talking about. Um, I, I have been struck how often, even in, in things that have no parents or Christian um, um, influence or background in, 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 in drama, how the theme, for instance, of, of forgiveness sometimes um, emerges and how, how utterly dramatic it can be. Um, uh, someone uh, that I did a, a, um, a podcast with a while back uh, told me he was a writer and, and sent me a story that he had written about forgiveness. And uh, it's an extraordinary story of, of um, he's Irish. And it was a, a, an incident. I'll just give you a quick recap in Northern Ireland. But it's it's a, um, someone in prison, a young man in prison at, uh, at a parole hearing who's recounting why um, his life is different. And right before going to prison, um, he explains that he he had murdered s someone uh, his age. Uh, again, it was the Protestant Catholic sort of, sort of the troubles, as they say. And uh, he had this experience that the the short story tells about the um, the father of this of the person who was killed and and how much he um, he wanted to kill the perpetrator and was set on destroying him and his life was ruined and he was so angry he had lost his son um but through um his w wife uh he was open to this idea of uh of a higher ide uh, ideal and you don't know quite what that is but um at the the last scene of the story you see that the father is sort of hunting for this young man who killed his son and finds him alone, um, uh, sort of isolated by a bonfire, and and uh, comes and confronts him, and says, you know, were you the one who did it? And yes, and and you think that this is going to be a scene of violence, but he walks over and he embraces the young man, and he says, um, I want you, to, I forgive you, and I want you to live the life that my son never could. And you know the 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 the, the way this this moment and it's something a scene like that just think about that you you're expect you're expecting a certain thing totally overturned and it's so it's so moving i mean it brings you to tears just to think of it um there's there's uh there's this entry into a, a just a whole whole sort of different level of of existence and i think that that beauty is that's just a very intense dramatic expression of beauty but i think all of beauty has something of that um in in plato's symposium uh beauty is 
his dialogue, which is about beauty, has all of these contradictions and mistakes and reversals. And in the dramatic exposition, everything is kind of going wrong. And it turns out to be this kind of chaotic mess. And you realize that beauty is not just the static thing, but it, it is this um, transcendental reality that is able at every moment to take up what seems to be disordered and to reveal it as a higher kind of order in a way that just again surprises you with joy it it, it it's it's overturns expectations but in in this really sort of dramatic way that's something about the very essence of beauty um there's a there's a yeah a lot to keep thinking about there but i i, I think uh um that's connected to the problem of evil actually you don't normally think of beauty in the problem of evil um well, you oh, have yeah, to, though, because the problem of evil, oh. whoops, did you get that echo? That's so weird. <laughs> <laughs> didn't hear it. Yeah. Because the, the, uh, the problem of evil, I mean, because love has to somehow be the solution to the problem of evil, right? Because love is the center of forgiveness. Right. And I think it was uh, St. Ignatius who said that Christ's body and his blood are the the incorruptible love mm. and in in your last chapter I think when you talk about um, God is being and love is being and you know obviously God right. is love right and right. so and and uh, creation mm. is being and so if, if if you're thinking along those lines then <clears throat> This relationship between beauty and love means that beauty is at the center of the cross. Yeah, yeah, right, right. right. Well, right. So, so I've often thought about this as being like goodness and truth. No, I'm sorry, truth and goodness, and then mm -hmm. beauty is is the intersection, right? That's lovely. Um, but that's where the suffering is, yeah. and, and there's this thing about beauty that there's a kind of suffering. You've talked about this before too. That that passion the word passion actually has this additional meaning of suffering or permitting yeah. something to open you up more right and right. beauty does that beauty has this simultaneous aspect of suffering and healing at the same time yeah. and that's why like some of the most um beautiful hymns or songs that i that i sing that move me the most are the ones that are talking about the suffering of christ so yeah, yeah. Um, and and isn't isn't it extraordinary how um it it's it appeals to everyone you know i mean people can be insensitive and 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 indifferent to the question of the truth or goodness but there's not a human being alive that doesn't respond to beauty and that, that that to me is 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 a, an amazing fact too. Um, it's uh, it 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 reaches the deepest into us in a way, and uh, re and has the most universal scope. Um, yeah, and as you, as you make the point in the book as well, it's not it's not just a conceptual thing. It's you you feel it in your body, and often, like as you said, you're you're overwhelmed to the point of tears. Like there's there's a sense, and even in that terminology or language of, of something greater than yourself mm. coming over you like and, mm. and uh, um overpowering you even your resistance to it um and you know as you were talking i, I thought you know the, one of the things that happens in our experience of beauty as well is the undeniable quality of the beauty you just related but also a sense that we, we also want as we behold beauty we also want to become beautiful ourselves mm -hmm. we also want to become united mm -hmm. to the beauty we behold and um and there's there's this 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 question that kind of relates to the problem of evil is like is is that transformation possible yeah. without suffering yeah yeah it seems well, it seems like our, at least in this this frame it, that those transformations always involve change that that has some correspondence with suffering one of the um effects of love that Aquinas addresses in the Summa is uh, uh, the wounding of love. This was a theme in medieval 
thought that love wounds by its nature and um that there is there is something about that um uh you know maybe because it you know it's because it 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 enters into us so deeply in one respect in another respect it's precisely the reality of the other that is entering so deeply you know so so you get that that passage that i quote in the book that i absolutely love from uh, iris murdoch um love is the difficult realization that uh something other than oneself is real um uh, there's there's a a profound truth to that and you know we could connect this also to the Christ, you know, the christological dimension um that that ultimately the suffering is uh uh is vicarious it's done for us that allows us then to enter into it ourselves um allows it to be fruitful um uh in our experience of it rather than something that's just destructive because uh, i think outside of outside of love and outside of this this um sense of um order and uh, a, a perfect god at the origin of all things this you know the experience of suffering can't be anything but violence and destruction and um kind of sort of perversion even even when when people seek it it's it becomes kind of masochistic and so forth well i think it was michael just said we want to be united to the beautiful and is it possible for that to happen without suffering mm -hmm. and <clears throat> one of the things i've been throwing mm -hmm. around in my notes i have it written down several different places to ask you is it possible that the beautiful is somehow related to an idea of fittedness? Oh, in yeah. the in the sense of yeah, when we make contact with reality, sometimes that contact tells us you're on the wrong track. That's right. That's right. right. And, yeah. and so part of uh, growing and developing and um, and often that requires suffering is to come to a place where you can get closer in that contact with reality where it's not always pushing back and saying, you know, you're not quite there. You're not quite, you're not quite fitting. That's and, right. And so the, the closer that the, the, the more we allow that movement in our lives, that it seems like the closer we can get it. it yeah. I mean, it's an asymptotic move, obviously, but. Um, <clears throat> No, that's that's the, yeah. No, thank you. That that uh, you know, here's here's another um, uh, piece of the argument that love and beauty are connected. I mean, that that in Aquinas he he talks about love as the word he uses is co-optatio, which is um, a kind of a fitting of two to each other. It's a kind mm -hmm. of a reciprocal uh, disposition towards a, a making fit um making suitable making apt is the word but that that um uh, i think that that connects it really in a beautiful way with with beauty which does have this sense of fittingness but you're absolutely right um uh especially you know existentially at certain stages in one's life one can experience beauty as uh as a painful judgment on one's own mm -hmm um it uh, unapt <laughs> character yes and but but you know if, if this is done precisely as um uh, an expression of beauty and love that's not i was gonna say it's not painful it is painful but it's painful and joyous at the same time um i was thinking the other day about this experience that some saints uh have of what they call the gift of tears. You mentioned Saint Ignatius. Apparently, mm -hmm. Saint Ignatius often had the gift of tears, um, and I've wondered about that. Uh, uh, what um, uh, it's it's the saints speak of it as something very precious. Um, it's foreign to me. I I I, I was I was uh, wondering what it would be like, but it seems to me um, it's got to be something along the lines of what you were describing here as. Uh, well, when the minute you said gift of tears, I immediately thought of this woman that I knew when I was a new believer in this little country church. And she was a person who, anytime she was in a situation where somebody was telling a story and you could tell that the person was hurting, mm -hmm. 
Mm. This woman would just begin weeping. Wow. Yeah. And it was it was as though she could so deeply feel empathically mm -hmm. what the other mm -hmm. was feeling. That and I wonder if that's what it meant when when they talked about him having the gift of tears. Mm -hmm. I, I'm mm -hmm. not that familiar with Saint Ignatius. I had just heard this this quote recently. So. Mm -hmm. um, but, apparently he would he would weep every time he said mass um uh he would he would tears would be pouring uh pouring out um well i mean yeah. it, that has to be a, a deep understanding of what he was i mean beyond a, not just a mental understanding but a, a deep compassion yeah. mm -hmm. um, co-optatio with what he yeah. was saying right yeah. Right. I've I've often so I just want to connect a few thoughts. I I've also been intrigued by that same subject of the gift of tears and and <clears throat> perhaps incorrectly or just I my conception of it is is the individual sort of connecting uh, I don't know with with certain in a certain sense with God's perspective on the situation or the person mm. or like you know again okay. mm. um and. And, and, and to that same measure, to, to go back to the co uh, uh, taptio, I don't know if I pronounced it correctly, but this sort of fittedness in that there's always in love, there's there's always going like levels of of unity and like mm -hmm. and at the highest levels, they be, like the two become one and, mm -hmm. you know, are, are somewhat indistinguishable, but yet still retain their, their own identities and so forth. But one of the things I also thought about that is that in all these relationships don't always happen at like a pure level, right? Because like, for instance, like, you know, my relationship, uh, I have a two-year-old and I I have to be, his ability to be fitted to me, mm -hmm. his capacity to, to fit himself to me is much less than my capacity to fit to him. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, there's, there's a certain greater burden on me. Right. Kind of. Right. Fit how I parent and sure. attend to him and, and call him into being in a way that's that's different than that, like if we were at a peer relationship, right? right. right. And so I, I often conceive of like there's a certain sense in which God is is uh, he he has this Infinitely sort of infinite burdened. capacity, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. To, to be this fit. And that, yeah. that, that in some sense, and, and this is something me and Karen have right remarked upon, like going back to this whole thing about impassable or not, like I, I feel like there there has to be a sense in which. I think I do think God has a certain level. There's a certain suffering or certain price that God pays in, in, in such that in some sense that the cross is emblematic of that sort of creative process. And it isn't just a sort of like one time historical event, but it's sort of, you know, Jesus says he's, he's comes to show the father. So he's, he's, he's kind of showing how um, God is, is always um, a kind of taking up this sort of burden for us and, 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 and stewarding us along these paths, even though, we are making our own choices. We we do have our own path, but in some sense, God is somehow uh, steering it such a way that, th that there is able to be this beautiful story in the end. So that he like like um, so it, 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 that that still involves all of these uh these 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 mistakes that we don't even some of which we don't even perceive ourselves making right now, right? Right. Right. Yeah. That that um um that uh rather than being this absolute that is simply discontinuous with anything in our experience or in anything in our capacity or, um you know beyond the the simply beyond the limits of the finite world i mean the the sort of circles back to the theme of postmodern thought there's so much in postmodern thought that in order to be sort of radical um Especially postmodern thought in in uh, philosophy of religion, to be radical uh, is to uh, emphasize over and over again how different God is from our conceptions. That we we can't you know any any word that we try to use falls short. That God infinitely transcends our our language, our thoughts, and so forth. And and that that seems to be um, kind of a radical recognition of the of the reality of God. But you know. Um, that that ends up. This is I th I think this is one of these kind of self self deceptive moves. Uh, that really does make God totally irrelevant to anything in the world, and so it kind of relieves the world of any any burden of dealing with God. It, it seems to me it's a, it's a far more radical thing to think of God as having 
entered into, you know, he fitted himself to us first. <laughs> so, so in fact, our words do matter because he has entered into, he is the word, has mm -hmm. entered into human words, has entered into the human condition. And in fact, um, uh, you know, this would be one of the insights that Balthazar um, uh, is known for, um, you know, he's gone sort of further below anything, any sort of abasement and and disorder that humans can contrive, that the, the um, entry into the taking up of the cross is sort of outflanking us from below, if you will. Um, you know, that's a much more radical sense, and, and that does not at all compromise God's infinite Perfection and infinite distance from us mean quite the contrary, um, but it does um, it does sort of unmask this effort to to keep him out of the, of the world. It sort of brings the the whole drama uh, right into the heart of our existence, and also then therefore into the really the ordinary things of our life. You, you know, things like raising a two year old. You can't get much more intimate than the way that the New Testament describes him filling me at the same time that I am growing up into him. Yeah. yeah. I have a lot of room to grow, but right. he's filling me, right? So he, he's filling to overflowing so that that anything that, that I have to give others is coming from that overflow of him filling me. And That's he right. does all that somehow without um, without damaging or hindering our unique individual personhood. That's right. That's the amazing thing. And, and I think that's another thing that the postmoderns completely don't get. And this is the importance of beauty here again, that that um, uh, it's, you know, this, the, the, fin the God's, the infinite embrace of finitude, to put it in that language, is a, is a total overturning of our expectations but rather than, but but it fulfills them. It's not, we recognize, oh yes, in fact, God is even more infinite for having done this, you know, uh, even more glorious. And that, um, that, that simultaneity is part of this sort of surprise that resolves, that is in the experience of beauty, that, that both is humbling and liberating, um, uh, and and sort of exhilarating. One 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 feels an, a, a heightened sense of agency and and selfhood and so forth in this. Um, it all com it all comes together. This has been so great, David. Um, I I know that you have another meeting coming up real quick, but do you have time for one last question? For sure, Michael? sure. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Michael. You get the last question. All right, I'm getting the last question. Um, yeah. You know, so my first introduction to your work was I actually, I, I think I heard um, Esther like at me in a conversation mentioning your work and she, uh, it was, I can't remember the exact title of it, but but essentially the argument you made in this um, this YouTube video that she, she had recommended was um, how philosophy begins and ends in wonder. Oh right, and so well, I, I wonder, wonder if you could, is the final word. Yeah, it, it, so I, I wonder if you could briefly um, relate wonder to this because I, what, one of the things that that I, I've always a, a, um, a quote by G.K. Chesterton that's always like really hit me between the eyes every time I think of it or or dwell on it is he says that gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder, mm. and I, it, it seems like the, like gratitude. And wonder seemed uh, this like sort of pathway into it, it, it's like this sort of self reciprocal thing where whereby both we're able to see the beautiful, but also somehow how we're able to stay in that moment of um, of exploring the depths of beauty rather than to to be pulled in um, um, back into kind of maybe maybe using it for more instrumental means. You know, it's well that that's it's so it's interesting. Uh, uh, gratitude is uh, happiness doubled by wonder. I mean, think about what uh, you know. Happiness can can become very self-referential. There's a sort of a tendency, the kind of a 
becoming self-satisfied. What is gratitude? It's it's a reference of your happiness to a, a cause outside of yourself. And there's a connection between that and the experience of wonder that there's that wonder is is precisely this attentiveness to what is outside of yourself. Um, and that's why that's why I think um, you know we tend to uh, one of the sort of classical um, formulations is that uh, that um, we we begin in wonder because we're ignorant. and the more we learn, you know wonder is meant to provoke the search, uh, but the search is meant to come to a destination in which wonder will be eliminated, I suppose. But that always struck me as just not quite right. And um, uh, I, I, I appreciate this idea of making real progress, but, but it seems to me it's much better to say that um, if, you, if you make all the connections that we've been making in this conversation here um, about uh, beauty and truth and goodness and their relations, you, you recognize that, that wonder and knowledge are, in, in a certain sense, convertible terms. And I think that the real growth is um, a beginning in imperfect knowledge, which is the same as imperfect wonder. <laughs> and the progression is to greater and greater knowledge that is coincident with greater and greater wonder. So there is a movement from the imperfect to the perfect, but it's not from wonder to knowledge. It's imperfect wonder and imperfect knowledge that uh, enters into ever more perfect knowledge and wonder. That seems to me a much more adequate formulation. Um, and, and, and that, that coincides with the fact that what we know is always an opening into greater, greater desire to know through beauty. So wonder's the final word. There we go. <laughs> well, one of the ways we talk about this in art is that you you see the seeds for your next work in mm. in your last work. Mm. So in every work you're seeking to always strive to get better, to get to know more and more what this idea is, but you never th get there because your vision always outruns your skill. Yeah. So but but you if you look at the previous painting, it will tell you what the next painting needs. And and so you're continually moving you know, in this asymptotic relationship upwards. So very good. Very nice. Well, well thank you. Thank you so much for this. And I will try to get something lined up with uh, Ian McGilchrist because I think the two of you would have just a marvelous conversation. He's a wonderful. Oh, wonderful oh thank you. I, I, I look forward to it. Yes, let's be in touch. And I will look into his work in the meantime. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Bye. You guys Thanks. have a great day. Bye-bye. Take care.